Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, like I said, my name is Matty Taos, and I get to be a uh, lead pastor here at Epiphany Station. And I get to lead us in kind of a special conversation today. But before I do, I want to let you know one more thing. Uh, is we have been given the ability to give uh, Kelly Van Squeak, our manager of operation, uh, a month of sabbatical through the month of October. Those of you clapping and applauding are those who appreciate the amount of work she does around here. And Kelly's been here for five years, and through those five years, nothing has stayed the same. Like, it's been downright chaos from start till end. And it came to the beginning of summer, and we just kind of realized uh, she hasn't had a break, and what her job is and what she does is not very well defined. And so she had a couple of retreats lined up in October, the beginning and the end, and it just seemed very providential to give her the month to be able to rest, to take a break, but really also for her to recalibrate what's happened over the last five years and what she's going to be coming back into because Epiphany Station changes so much. And so Epiphany, we're going to be kind of looking into that role of what it is and what it needs to be moving forward, and then as she comes back in, kind of working that out together. But if you see Kelly anywhere, don't talk to her, leave her up now, I'm only kidding. She would hate that with a fiery passion. Um, encourage her, let her know uh, that you're thinking about her, praying about her, take her out to coffee, and the whole purpose of this is for her good and for the good of the whole church family, and so that's something cool that we've been able to do this month. Now, like I say, we're a bit of a special conversation today because we're kind of between teaching series, and wherever we're between teaching series, it's an opportunity to talk about something that has been happening or kind of we've been aware of as a, as a church family or as a staff that we want to address that we want to talk about. And really the conversation that we get to have is how your life, your faith, your spiritual journey with God, your relationship with Him, how that is distinct and that is unique. Your experiences are your own, but always and forever it will be intermingled. It will be interlinked, entwined inextricably with others. We're gonna have a conversation of what about what it means to do with your faith in a context of we how it works, how not only church, but a lot of other things work in tow to show you that when it comes to your faith, you are actually not on your own. If we don't take time to talk about how we do faith with others, oftentimes we end up repeating something lesser than. Like it takes some time to talk about what to expect and what you want to bring about in your life. The reason we're having this conversation is I talk to so many people, honestly, too many people for me that believe that they're alone. Especially when it comes to being a believer, they still think and see the reality of their lives that they seem to be alone. They wake up alone, go to work alone, come home from work alone, go to sleep alone. And these people are not just people who are single. There are people who are married who go to church alone. There are people who are married that feel like they're doing their entire lives alone. Full families feel alone. There are many people now that feel ostracized and cast out for different opinions and that they sit and stand in life alone. You've got social anxiety that makes you feel alone. You've got once burned, twice shy that makes you feel alone. Now, all of these things lead to us trying to live out our faith in a way that doesn't quite jam, it doesn't quite work, and we know something's wrong, we know something's missing, but we don't quite know what. And so we're going to have this conversation. We're going to have a conversation. I want to let you know a few things that God knows about you and a few things that God knows you actually need. Because he wants you to know so desperately that you're not alone. He wants you to know that you have a spiritual family. He wants you to know that you have a spiritual heritage. And he wants you to know that there is, in fact, a spiritual army consistently around us as believers. Now, quick show of hands. Those of you in the room, have any of you ever, at any point in your life, like as a child, as a teen, as an adult, anything like, had to complete, you can't put your hand up yet, Tommy, I haven't even said what it is. Have you ever like completely, like had your life completely picked up and moved and started somewhere else absolutely fresh? Put your hand up if that's happened. Okay, it's a good chunk of you, it's a good, it's a good chunk. Um, have you ever, another hands up moment, have you ever... Like been in a new community, been in a new school, been in a new workplace for quite a good chunk of time and still felt alone. Okay? And here's the kicker. Have you ever gone to church for a good chunk of time 
Like you go regularly and then you realize that you're still quite alone. That's the problem. The problem is that so much of our lives, I believe that we experience on our own, but are also being told you're only worth being on your own. Too many people for too long spend too much of their lives alone. I moved from Rillington, North Yorkshire in England to Thief River Falls, Minnesota, big city to big city. And I, <laughs> and my wife and I, we, we got here and we both started working. We would attend family events uh, with our kids and, and try and find connections. We even started trying out a church for a while and we tried to connect, but honestly, it took months, like months and months and months for us to feel like we belonged. Now, I'm learning retrospectively that might have something to do with the fact that I used to fly the English flag out front of my house for like the first years here. And you guys since 1812 are still a little bit worried we might sneak back in. But, <laughs> but honestly, like for us, for Jackie and I, like it was a couple of years. And that was with church and that was with relationships and that was with all these other things. It, it was too long. It's too long for a man to be alone with just his wife. It's too long for a woman to just be alone just with her husband. It's too long for a family to be isolated. It's too long for a believer not to have community. The thing that we can talk about now is that that's not okay with God. It's not his plan. It's not his attention for us to be alone. And God wants you to know some things. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to jump into the Old Testament. It's the old half of the Bible, which if you want to summarize what the Old Testament is, it's set in the table. It's set in the scene for everyone to know who God is and what we mean to him and what he was going to do through Jesus Christ. But if you go to Old Testament, and we're going to kind of shoot to a guy called Elisha, and he's in uh, 2 Kings, 2 Kings, and there's a moment that happens that I think is essential for us if we're going to call ourselves believers in, in God and what he does and, and what he provides that is important for us to take ownership of for ourselves. Backstory of Elisha is like he's going through the world over sandcastles. Like anyone who's doing anything evil or bad, like he's just there on the scene. And specifically, he has an enemy. Israel, God's people, has an enemy that seeks to destroy. And God is telling Elisha every single plan the enemy has. Like he's going to do this, and he's going to move his army here, and he's going to attack this city, he's going to do that. And Elisha just wanders over to the king of Israel like, hey, Here's what he's doing next. And he ruins his plans consistently. This king gets so furious. He says, what's going on? All my generals, you're terrible. And he says, no, it's this guy called Elisha in Israel. And the king kind of gets a bit of a beef. Here's what he says. We're in chapter 6. We're in verse 13. He says, go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. The report came back. Elisha is in Dothan. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to, to surround the city. Now, when the servant of the man of God, the servant of Elisha, the guy who was with Elisha, got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. He came back in from his morning errands and realized the entire city was surrounded by people who wanted Elisha dead, which also meant wanted him dead. And he came back in and said, oh, sir, what are we going to do now? Now, if you're looking for the person that you're going to connect with in this story, I know you'd like it to be Elisha. You might even want it to be the king of Aram. I don't know. But this is our guy. Our guy is Elisha's guy and comes in and doesn't know what's going on and knows and sees that they're alone, that they're surrounded, that they're lost. And he says, sir, what are we going to do now? So many, so much of our lives are lived in the fear that we're lost, that it's done for. Like this, that's tipping point in life. And to ourselves or another, we throw our hands up and say, well, what am I gonna do now? Look what the state is mandating now. What are we gonna do now? Look what group A just did and how group B are responding. What are we gonna do now? And so much of our lives are spent in this hopeless turmoil of fear considering that as things swirl around us, as things surround us, now what? It's lost. What are we going to do now? Now, that's for those of us who are dramatic like me. Some of you are not so dramatic. You just have some of that consistent residual feeling of, what am I going to do now? 
It's a daily thing of, of considering yourself to be not part of a greater plan, a greater purpose, or a greater worth, but just considering that you're just kind of there. What am I going to do now? Elisha knows more than his guy knows. He sees more than his guy sees. His response to what should we do now is to not be afraid. And he gives not just some Christianese quote, say, don't be afraid. He says, here's why not to be afraid. This is what he says, continuing on. He says, don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his, open my guy's eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes and when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Now, what happens then continuing is the entire army against Elisha gets blinded. And Elisha is able to lead them to a completely different place that they didn't even know that they were going. And he sets them free. Now, all of this to say, Elisha's guy didn't see it. He didn't know. He didn't observe and didn't see what Elisha could see. And so fear had a grip on him until Elisha actually prayed, open your eyes. As he prayed that God would open his eyes because you see what's going on, not just in the physical, but what's going on in the spiritual. Not what's just going on in circumstance, but what's actually going on in the spiritual realm that we often, too often, do not give credit to and therefore do not see. If we saw what Elisha sees, we would see consistently that there are more on our side, more on our team than there are on theirs. That there are legitimate angels that outnumber any enemy that could ever come against us, ever. That they are unfathomable. That when they're spoken of, they fill the skies and they make noises that we can't even comprehend. And they don't even look like anything that we can comprehend. And we can read about things like that and say, well, yeah, okay, so there's angels. And Elisha gets angels. And isn't that great? But that's not me. Surely those angels are for people like Elisha, like doing great God's work. And he's a prophet. And he's doing all these things. And we put ourselves immediately in some lesser category not deserving angels. Hebrews 1.14 says this. Therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. Angels are not the point. And they shouldn't become a point of worship or a point of too much focus. There's something given Servants of, servants of God for the people who decided to make Jesus Christ their king, who are going to inherit salvation, they're actually at those people's disposal for their care, for their defense, for their protection. Angels talk to kings and they defend prophets. They encourage the weak. They provide for those who cannot provide for themselves and they tell a couple of scared women one morning that Jesus Christ has risen. That's what angels do. But too much of our lives living in the physical, seeing what we can see and only what we can see, we don't consider that there are angels around all of those that are going to inherit salvation. And so we actually look about our lives and think there are more on their team than ours, that we're in the minority, that I'm not going to win. God knows that you have very real enemies and he has a very real spiritual army that is at disposal of those who need it the ones who desire to live their lives honoring God. There are far more on our team than theirs. There are far more ways that God goes about it too. It's not just angels. Jumping from the Old Testament to the New Testament into the book of Hebrews where we'll spend the rest of our time, which, if you're a Bible reading person, read the book of Hebrews this week. If you don't have a Bible, info table, Bible free for you. Now, in the book of Hebrews, our pivotal point, our pivotal moment in Hebrews, it's Hebrews chapter 11. If you're a Bible reading person, but only a little bit, go read Hebrews 11, because that's going to give you, it's going to give you a good idea of what we're talking about. Because Hebrews 11 is a list. It's a phenomenal list, but it's kind of a short list of people that God wants you to know about. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Samson, 
Barak, Rahab, Jephthah, Samuel, David, and the people of Israel that lived faithfully. There's this list there of people who lived their lives by faith, and these were priests and prophets and kings. They were also murderers, prostitutes, and traitors. They were judges, they were traders, they were farmers. They were also someone's dad, someone's husband, someone's wife, and they were children. And all of them ended their lives knowing that they were children of God. All of them ended their lives knowing who they were and who they belonged to. And all of those people, all of them and all of the ones not listed, they're your people. They are where you come from. They are your spiritual ancestors. We believe, we have faith, a lot based on the witness of these people. We are not just where we were birthed from, not the nation that we think we belong to. These are the people that we come from. And that's Hebrews 11, then it goes into Hebrews 12 and says this. Therefore, Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to live the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Everyone that you see in the Bible, in one way or another, and in fact, everyone you've ever come into contact is witnessing to you something. They're not witnessing you. They're not watching you. They're telling you something. And the list that God gives is a list of people that said, you can trust God. I have lived my life, and I have put my trust in God, and I have done it imperfectly, and I've screwed up monumentally, and I've ended my life in faith. This crowd of witnesses who are here to tell you he can be trusted and you're not alone. These people that have gone before you, not just these, but the countless others, those before Christ and after Christ and those who are alive today have gone through what you've gone through. They'll go through what you're going through. They've been where you're headed. And they're crying out to you, it can be done. It can be done and you're not alone. We get all of the Bible and we get all of the church, the 1.3 billion spread out across the earth right now, actually for our benefit, our credit, that we would be able to hear their witness, their testimony. To know that all those things back there that other people have told us and the things that people are still telling you today that just aren't true, those are not people who are witnessing to you the truth. Instead, we're given witnesses knowing that we're surrounded by a huge crowd saying you can trust in your God. And so you're given a spiritual army. You're given a spiritual heritage, all for you, good of you, purpose of you, that you would trust in your God more. That's not it. That's not it either. As we continue in Hebrews, we kind of find in it the purpose that the letter of Hebrews was written, the point of it, the whole goal which was to bind people together knowing who they belong to, knowing who is most valuable, the champion and perfecter of their faith, the one that gets all of the glory, but now who is surrounding them with it? We see what we get in Hebrews 10, 23-25, and it's this, it's much quoted, Hebrews 10, 23-25, when it comes to church, especially through COVID in the last couple of years. But one of the big takeaways from it is often not really the actual point of it. And there's so much more to it than what we usually take. Here's what Hebrews 10 says. It says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I've heard that thrown out a lot over the last couple of years, saying we need to meet. We need to meet. The church needs to meet. The church can't stop meeting. And we need to meet, we need to meet, and we need to meet. And that's what it says, absolutely. But you know 
that people gathering in a building does not a church make. In fact, you can meet whoever you want for however long you want, and it doesn't give you what you actually need. The purpose and point of Hebrews 10 is actually telling you what happens and what needs to happen when anyone will meet, wherever they will meet, outside of Sunday morning be it, what needs to happen. What needs to happen is that we will hold tightly to the promise and the faith that we have in Christ because God can be trusted. What has to happen in it is we need to be encouraged by one another to love, encouraged towards the very best parts of who we are. It says, let us hold tightly, let us motivate and encourage, and let us meet. Let us make sure that we continue to meet, absolutely. But it's not just that. It's supposed to be where something happens, where eyes are focused on the perfecter of our faith, the champion of our faith, Jesus Christ, and anything can be called church. But church is only church when it does that, and it does it together, and it does it as a family. It does it where people come with, them, with an acknowledgement that my part to play in that is actually to bring hope and witness. My part to play in that is to bring encouragement and motivation is to create a place where we are interdependent upon one another because the day of his return is drawing near. That when we get to the end, what we want to be able to say is, we got to the end. And we endured this race that's laid out in front of us. Mary was talking a little bit earlier about uh, church families. It's kind of a new thing that's been developing over the last, real, really, a few years. Acknowledging the fact that Sunday morning isn't sufficient. Gathering together for a 30, 45 hour, hour 30 if I'm feeling audacious. It's not church. It's a bit of church. It's a bit of the gathering of church, sure. But what church actually is, is an interconnected, interdependent group of people that encourage one another to get their eyes on the perfecter and champion of their faith, Jesus Christ. That's church. And you can use that to describe any church that has ever been or ever will be across the globe. It's that. And so we have been working on this thing called church families. Not the answer to all things, not perfect by any means, but as a goal, as a purpose, as a means to the end. And if we're without that, I believe that we're without one of the major ways that God wants us to know that we're not alone. That he wants us to know that we're encouraged. He wants us to know that there are people fighting for us. And if we choose to be without, then we are without. See, here's a few things that God knows. God knows that you have very real enemies. There are wicked people that want you to fail and fall. You have very real enemies. There are people that want to remove you from a relationship with God. You have very real enemies, spiritual enemies, demonic enemies that want to take you and tear you away from Christ. He knows this, and he wants you to know it, because what he knows he then provides for, and he gives you more on your side than on theirs. He gives you more of a spiritual army, more competent, more capable, more powerful than any enemy you could ever face. But our problem is our eyes are like Elisha's guy, close to it. We don't pray to see what's going on in the spiritual because it's scary stuff. We don't pray to see angels on the move. We don't pray and ask him to surround us. We don't pray for protection. We don't pray for provision. We don't pray for strength that angels would come and support us. Yet they're there. And it would seem that this enacted for this guy when Elijah prays that he would see it. God also knows this. He knows that you have weaknesses. He knows that you do have failings and flaws. These are things that you might have been working on, working on for decades, and he knows that they're there, and he knows that there are struggles, and he knows that one of the big ones is your identity. Who you belong to, where you come from, and your worth is a consistent theme in conversation I have with people that tears them down. He knows this. And because he knows this, he provides for this, and he gives you witnesses. He gives you witnesses, and he gives you witnesses. People who will tell you different from what the enemy would have you know or the people would have you know. People will tell you what he has done in their lives, why he is trustworthy, and what he has actually said about you. Jesus Christ came here to earth to prove how worthy you are of his love, how much you are worth, how much he wants you specifically. 
And now you're provided witnesses that all we have to offer is saying that's what Jesus did for you to show you what he thinks of you. And here's another thing God knows. He knows that you often feel lonely. He knows that. The great thing that has happened to us because of sin is division and loneliness. A feeling that we are in it on our own. That no one cares for us like, anyone, like we do. That no one can love us. That we're not even worthy of it. And for all the blemishes and imperfections and downright screw-ups, he still gives the church. That's his plan A. That the church will be filled with people who will tell other people what is true. That will show them that they are loved. It will come to the place of realizing and seeing just how important it is that we not go, but we be. That we not take, but we give. That we look at a small group of people, because we can't all connect with us all, where we are truly known and we truly know them. Encouraging towards the perfecter of our faith. These are the things he knows. These are the things he wants you to know. He wants you to know that he knows you and that he sees you, and that he hears you, and that he provides everything that you need towards one end and one end alone. The Apostle Paul said it best in a letter to his protege, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, and I've remained faithful. I have not remained perfect. It has not been an easy walk. It has been a fight. It is a fight to remain faithful. It is a race that needs to be run, and God gives the things that we need to be able to run it well. He gives us a spiritual heritage, a people you come from, a people you belong to, that is full of ragtag misfits that ended faithful. He has given you angels for you to know that they are present, that they are present in your life at the disposal, therefore, everyone who is going to inherit salvation. And he's given you the church to walk with you into your future. Now these are things he wants you to know, things that he wants you to have. And if part of this conversation, you're honestly, one of those three is just downright missing for me. Like I don't know where I come from, I don't know this, I don't know what God would say about me, I don't know what these witnesses are trying to tell me. We would love nothing more than to have a conversation with you about that. If you're at the point now where you don't even know what I just said about Jesus Christ coming to show you how worth you are, how much worth you have, we'd love nothing more than to tell you that. If you're in a place that you don't understand angels and you want to understand them honestly, to have those conversations about them, we would love to have that conversation with you. And if you're missing church, if you're missing out on what it means for church to be church as God intended it to be, we would love to talk to you about it. Right now in our church families, we have 147 people in them. That's about 65% of Epiphany's adults. That is good. That's really good. But that tells me that there's about 35% of people, there's about 80 people that don't. Maybe they do. Maybe they have something else going on, and that's fantastic, and that's phenomenal. But our goal is to see us all in a church family. And for that to happen, we need more of them because they're all plumb full. We don't make them go too big because then you don't get to know each other. And so we need more people who will be willing to be church family pastors, people who take responsibility for leading church families and creating church in their home. And we need more of these for more people. Because these are the things that God has called us to give, to provide, to be the church together. Now at the end of our conversation, I'm going to be down front here on the right if you want to come talk to me. Mary's going to be out at the info table if you want to go talk to her about any of the things we have a conversation about but it doesn't matter really who you are or where you're coming from. Here are the things that I want you to know. I want you to know what God knows. God knows what you need. God knows that you need to know where you came from. God knows you need witnesses. God knows that you need spiritual defense for the things that you cannot fight on your own. And God knows that you need the church. He knows that you need family. And so he seeks to provide all of it for you because of his deep love for you. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you that um, your purpose is for our provision. 
it is our, to prove to us really who you are and who you said you are. So God, I ask you to open our eyes. I pray right now that you would open our eyes to who is on our side, to those who outnumber our enemies. I pray that you would open our eyes to the witness of believers who have gone before us, believers who stand alongside us today. And I pray that you would open our eyes to what the church is, can be, should be, will be, as we submit it to you. We ask for you to continue to provide those areas, for those areas of weakness where we struggle, and for us to submit those areas that we're still holding on to, and that we're still trying to do alone. I pray that you make us a church where no one feels alone, where everyone knows their worth, knows that they're loved by you, and knows that Christ is their rescue and salvation. And pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.